But I was sitting in the back seat with my mom, and we were driving, and it was just real quiet. I was kind of looking at the prison. I remember my brother, I I guess he was looking at me in the rearview mirror, and he said, you're glad to be leaving that place, huh? I just think I shook my head, but I remember thinking, it seems weird to be saying this. I knew I was going to miss all those guys, and I felt horrible that I was leaving, and I knew they were still there. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and this is a continuation of my, I guess, really, it's just of my my story. Maybe it, this may be part 14. It may be part 25. I'm not sure. Colby's breaking it up in all kinds of different things. Um, so, at this point, I'm going to go back. I just, the last video, uh, or the last two videos, I explained about my lawsuit with um, Ephraim, uh, uh, Deborah Rowley and Warner Brothers over the movie War Dogs. So, uh, let me go back to me when I first got to the halfway house. So, I kind of explain how part of that, how that went through while I was in the halfway house. Or while that was happening during prison and the halfway house. But, let me explain about the halfway house. I'm sure people have heard about halfway houses before. So, so what happens is, just as you know, you're coming up on your last whatever year of of incarceration you know typically if you're lucky you they your counselor will put you in for a halfway house and you know the reason you need halfway house is you know it's it's important i may have said this in the last video or two but it's important you you need it so you need it because one obviously you know it helps you reacclimate to just society in general and there are little things that it seems silly, but like after like 12, 13 years of, in prison, it, there are little tiny things that you stop or that I stopped doing just because it's frowned upon in prison. You know, like saying please and thank you. Like guys don't say please and thank you in prison. It's it's a, yo, let, let me get some sugar. Or yo, let, you got some coffee? Yeah, let me get some. And that's just, everybody talks like that. If you don't talk like that, then essentially you end up getting pegged to someone who's super soft. So you have to walk around all the time acting like, I don't, I don't want to say like a tough guy or like a, you know, but you just lose all of the, the, the you know, the social graces or your, you know, the grease that helps people not kill each other, I guess, in society, which is, you know, pleasantries and things. Well, initially it, it was... I don't know. Did I tell the the sandwich story? Have you heard me talk about the chicken at the gym with the sandwich? Listen, it was so bad. It was so bad that you know this is it, and this just really is kind of like a, it's it's a, very much a prison mentality, which bothers me because I I really didn't realize how bad it was for me. And I'll I'll go into the halfway house in a second, but I'll just give you an example of how just how mentally disturbed you become or, 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 you know, altered as a result of being in prison for so long. And, and honestly, like I wasn't in a, in a super tough prison. I mean, I'm not saying people weren't getting, there weren't lots of fights and people weren't getting stabbed, but you know, I started at a medium, which was, you know, is a rough place, but there are rougher mediums obviously. And there are, there are non rougher mediums, right? Like I was in an average medium. Like it wasn't super soft, but it, it wasn't hard. Like you didn't have to run with the gang. But if you didn't run with a gang, like you better not get yourself in trouble because ain't nobody backing you up. Now I'm lucky because I didn't get in trouble a lot, you know, or, or very much or mo- nothing I couldn't get myself out of. You know, like I didn't, ru- I didn't gamble, so I didn't run up debts. I didn't borrow from anybody. Um, and I didn't allow myself to be you know, beholden to anyone. So I, I, so I'll give you an example. Like when I got out of prison, I ended up getting a job. I'll explain. I got a job with my buddy and, and I'm not like a, an aggressive person by nature. Uh, I, I consider myself, maybe I'm assertive. Like I, I want to, I go after what I want, but I don't, I don't think I'm aggressive in, in any way. And my, assertiveness had very much turned to aggression where people were constantly like friends of mine would tell me like, bro, you're like super aggressive. 
Like, you don't realize how aggressive you are. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, even that, like that, what are you talking about? Like, it's, 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 oh, you're just overtly aggressive about everything. So I had to really tone it back. And, and I, where I was like, no, man, I'm just assertive. And they were like, yeah, you're, you're, you're overboard. It's not assertiveness. It's, it's aggression. But in prison, that's normal. Like in prison, I'm soft as cotton. And I'm, and, and, and I was acting like, no, I'm, I, you know, I'm saying, hey, man, can I get some of that? You know, uh, what, uh, what's going on with so-and-so? Yeah. Well, how come? Well, what, why, why do you do that, bro? Like, I mean, it's just super like aggressive. And it was just, so I, I had really, it took, it takes you a while to kind of tone it down. It was, and I, I still had that mentality. Like I went to, so I'll tell you one of the things at the halfway house, they give you a, when you go to work every day, you get, you get breakfast for free, right? Like they give you breakfast. You can pay for extra stuff, but they give you breakfast. Um, and then when you leave for the day, they'll give you a bag lunch. So when you go to work, the reason they do this is they don't want you to leave work. They're like, we're giving you a bag lunch because you don't have permission to leave and go to, you know, you can't, you can't go to a restaurant and come back. You have to, here's your bag lunch, stay at work and eat. And they're going to call several times during the day. So you better be there or you may have an ankle monitor on. So they give you a bag lunch. Well, I remember one time this, this, this uh, woman was leaving the gym where I worked. She was going to get, um, she was going to get lunch and I'd been there for like two months and she was going to get lunch and she said to me, she was, Matt, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to get lunch. She goes, she goes, you want something? And I went, um, no, I'm good. I'm good. I've, I've got my bag. I've got a, I've got a, uh, you know, like I had like a bologna sandwich. I go, I've, I got a sandwich. I got a bag of lunch. I'm good. And she goes, no, come on. She goes, you eat that every day. She goes, she was going, where was she going? She was going to, um, Jimmy John's. She goes, let me get you a sandwich from Jimmy John's. And I went, no, I'm good. I, I, I've got a bag of lunch. I'm good. And she said, she goes, come on. She said, you're always eating that. You're, you, she goes, it's got, you've got to be tired of bologna sandwiches. Well, sometimes we got peanut butter. So you, you know, so, you know, you got to be tired of those sandwiches. And I went and, and she, I said, well, I don't really have money to be buying, to be going to lunch. Like, you know, it's like 10 bucks to go to lunch. Right. So I said, I don't really have money to do that. So I'm good with the bag lunch. And she goes, no, it's okay. She, she goes, I got it. I've, I've, I've got it. I'll pay for it. And I, and I went, you know, I, like, I didn't understand. I didn't, you, you know, for clarity's sake, I said to her, listen, let me, let me be very clear about this. And I remember my, my buddy with Trion was there and, and a couple, and, and like one of the other employees is there and they're looking at me. I go, let me be very clear. I said, if you are saying that you are, want to buy me a sandwich at Jimmy John's with your own money and that you do not expect that at any time in the future I'm going to pay you back or that I'm going to reciprocate by buying you something in the future. If you are simply buying me a sandwich out of the goodness of your heart and do not expect me to ever pay you back in any way, Yes, I will take a sandwich from Jimmy John's. If you are thinking that at some point in the future, this will come back to you or I will be beholden to you in any way, please do not buy me anything. I have a bag of lunch. I'm fine. And I remember my buddy Trion looked at me just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And she looked at me and she just kind of smiled and she goes, let me buy you a sandwich at Jimmy John's. You don't ever have to pay me back. And I went, I mean, okay, I don't know. I'll, I'll take whatever, whatever you want to get me. That's fine. You know, like that's how clear you kind of have to be in prison because someone will give you something in prison and you think maybe you've just been there maybe six months or a year. Maybe someone's putting money on your books, you know, or I'm sorry, on your, your account so you can buy stuff. So you're not realizing how desperate people's situations are and the prison economy uh, and, and, and what taking something from someone means. So maybe one day you're in prison and you run out of, uh, you run out of coffee and you turn to your, your, 
Selly or the guy in the cube next to you, which you've talked to all of 10 times in the last two months or six months, and you go, hey, man, you got any coffee? And they go, yeah, I got, yeah, I got some. You go, oh, bro, can I get some coffee? They go, sure. They give you some coffee. No big deal. You get a little bag of instant coffee, Keefy coffee, and they give you a scoop of coffee, and you go, okay. And, you know, you drink your coffee. You know, what does that cost? 15, 20 cents for a scoop of coffee. The, the bag's like $3.50, right? So you get maybe 20, 30 bags. That's what, you know, what does that break down to? 20 cents, 25 cents? So he gives you a scoop. No big deal. You know, you don't care. It's not a big deal. Um, you don't think anything of it. You certainly do the same for him. And come commissary, a couple days later, he comes to you and he says, yo, bro, bro uh, uh, I need to uh, give me a bag of coffee. And you go, Okay, for, all right, well, why am I getting you a bag of coffee? Yo, man, you borrowed coffee from me the other day. You got some coffee from me the other day, so give me a bag of coffee. It's like, you gave me a scoop of coffee out of your bag. Like, that's 25 cents. A bag of coffee is three fifty. So, or maybe you just say, you shrug it off, and you go, yeah, man, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah good. no problem. And you get him the $3.50 because maybe it doesn't matter to you. The problem with that mentality is you're like, oh, it doesn't matter. I got people put three. I got I got my my wife or my kids or my buddy Jimmy who's putting 300 bucks a month on my books or something. So maybe you don't care. The problem is that that guy ends up kind of joking about it or telling people about it. And now people think they can ask you for stuff. You kind of get that. This guy's a sucker mentality, you know, or a sucker reputation. So what ends up happening is if you borrow something from someone, you got to be super clear. Hey, bro, let me borrow a thing of coffee and I'll give you one back, a cup of coffee back or a scoop of coffee, whatever you want to say, you know, when I get my commissary. So I'll get you a scoop back, but that's it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, bro. Or they say, hey, man, you know what? Don't even worry about it. I don't even want anything. You sure? Yeah, I don't want to. No, no, man. It's a scoop of coffee. It's nothing. Okay, cool. We got an agreement. We have an understanding. If you don't have that understanding very clearly, it can go bad for you. And if you're not some super jacked up fucking guy, then you've got a real problem. Because you've got to be super clear all the time. So, you know, because it could go bad and there's not much you can do about it. And if you're not running with some gang, then you've got a real problem because there's nobody backing you up. Well, you know, like I'm super, super clear on everything. Like the one great thing is I have great communication skills. So anyway, so but like I said, that was my I was very clear about everything and very, very semi, I'd say aggressive. So when I got to the halfway house. Listen, when I got to the halfway house, I weighed 150 pounds because the last six months of, of prison, so I was 185. The last six months of prison, I weighed 185 pounds in prison. Last six months, I thought, you know what? Like, I'm going to gain some weight probably when I get out. Right? Everybody's, you've heard of the freshman 15, right? Like, you go to college, you either lose 15 or you, or you gain 15 pounds. So... Same thing with prison. You get out, you either gain 15 or 20 pounds, you either lose 15 or 20 pounds. Well, I thought, you know what, I'm, I, I know, like I don't eat a lot, so, but I am probably going to be out there. And I probably will gain some weight. So I better go ahead and start losing some weight. So I went from 185 pounds, I was probably closer to 190, all the way down to 150 pounds. I weighed 148 or 149 pounds, I think like the morning I left the morning I left prison. I remember. So when you leave prison, if nobody, so all right, let me jump back. I'm all over the fucking place. Anyway, there's a lot of things to cover. So what what happens is the last whatever year, a year before you're scheduled to get released, your counselor will put you in for a halfway house. Now I'd been locked up so long I should have gotten a year, but. There were a lot of things happening with Trump and with a lot of – there were a lot of laws. Trump had signed it, signed some stuff where he'd signed a, a, 
um, I don't know if it was a, I don't know if it was a bill or I don't know if it was an, I think it was an executive order where the Bureau of Prisons used to, it says you're supposed to do 85% of your time, right? But the Bureau of Prisons for some reason had calculated it where it was, people were doing on average 87 and a half percent of their time. And so you were supposed to get 54 days a year and you were actually getting like 46, 47, 40 five days a year or something, good time. So off of your sentence, if you're good, if you behave well, they knock some some time off. Like it's supposed to be 15%, it wasn't. It was like 12 and a half. So, and they supposedly, you know, Obama was going to correct it. He never did. You know, everybody was always going to correct it, right? Well, I'm going to fix that. Now, well, they never did. Uh, Trump got in there and he signed it. He said, yeah, that's ridiculous. It says 85. Why aren't they calculating it? So it's 85 from now on. Well, what ended up happening was, because of that, there were people that had six months, a year, years of, of good time that had to come to them. And so if you did 15 or 20 years, then suddenly, bam, you get a year off or X amount of time off. So guys were being thrust into the halfway house. And initially I was given, I wanted 12 months, but this was going on at that time. And I knew it was probably going to get less than that. I remember I got like nine, I want to say nine and a half or 10 months halfway house. And I was like, oh, that's not quite what I expected, but that's fine. So like a few months, like probably, you know, what was really messed up about this. I called my mother and told her I was coming home on a certain date. So at that point, I was writing, talking to my brother on the phone and telling him like, hey, man, I, I need clothes sent in. Because if you if you leave, you're going to leave half you're going to leave the halfway house. I'm sorry, you're going to leave prison with just what you have. Like, you're going to be able to walk out with, like, sweatpants. If you might have some sweatpants and a T-shirt. So I'm going to the halfway house and sweatpants and a T-shirt. And probably, like, there are guys, like, or tennis shoes. I guess you could probably, and, and tennis shoes. Like, you, you can buy stuff like that on commissary. So, and I did have some of that stuff. Stuff that was okay to wear in prison. But if you saw me walking around in the sweatpants that they give you, they're like sweatpants from like the 1980s. Like they're like real sweatpants. They're not like the cool sweatpants we have now. And the sweatshirts are like sweatshirts. Like the t-shirts are like, eh, they're pretty much Fruit of the Loom or Hanes or something. They're all right. Uh, and then the tennis shoes are just really, you know, kind of just basic tennis shoes, which I had crappy basic tennis shoes. So I would have been leaving in that. And if you don't have anything like that, which some people do, some people have nothing. So those people end up leaving with, you know, they'll actually, Bureau of Prisons will give you a pair of blue jeans, which are blue jeans that I, I swear to God, they're like something that a poor peasant in, uh, some peasant in, you know, Guatemala would be wearing. Like, I mean, like they're just straight leg, you know, like cut out, like stitched through. I mean, they really, they're that bad. And they'll give you like a, a, a brown t-shirt that is probably 10 years old and 60 um, inmates have worn it because they recycle the clothes. So you, when you get there, you don't get a brand new uniform. You get a uniform that somebody else wore for four years. And then when he left, it went back in the pile and they wash it and they fold it and here's your uniform. So you've got, I always love it when you watch, you ever see like a Orange is the New Black or... Any prison TV show, they come out and their orange jumpsuits are bright color. Like, they're like a bright orange. I ain't never seen a bright orange uh, jumpsuit in my life. Like, I've never, you know, <laughs> I, it's, it's always, you're like, okay, so they order that off the internet and they had this guy put it on. Like, if they want to make it look right, they got to wash it about 600 times, lay it in the sun for about five or six weeks, beat it up really bad cut some stuff off because you'll get a jumpsuit and the legs will be too long. So guys will cut off six or eight, six or eight inches of, of, you know, or you'll get, the nice thing is when you get to prison, you get, you get regular, like, like a uniform. Um, I tell you what though, what you don't realize is the sizes are all fucked up. So I remember when I got there, I ordered like I, I was at that point, I was heavy when I first came into prison. I had already lost some weight. Um, and when I first got there and I ordered, I got, I ordered like a, like a size, like a waist, like a 32 inch waist. Cause I was 
you know, maybe 33. And I said, yeah, 33. And the guy looked at me and he goes, he goes, man, they like the sizes run small. I went, okay. And he said, you sure you want a 33? And I went, yeah, man, I, I wear a 33. I, I'll be all right. I've lost some weight. That's what I was wearing, 33, 34s. And he goes, all right. So he gave them to me. Listen, those pants were like a size 30. I mean, I was sporting a camel toe for about two weeks. I got three pair of these pants, and I'm walking around with like a camel toe for three weeks. The first three weeks I'm in prison, not a good look for a soft looking for a soft white guy in a medium security prison. Like I was very popular. You know, everybody wanted to be my friend. You know what I'm saying? They all want to, I'm getting guys offering me tennis shoes and stuff. It's not a good thing. It's not good. It's not, you need anything? No, no, I don't need it. I'm fine. But look, I got the pants are too tight. It's not what it looks like. So it took me about two weeks to get new pants. So I'm wearing like a size 38. And they're okay. They're like slightly loose. You know, it's um, it's not funny. It's, it's bad. It's a bad situation, bro. So what what happened is I so I remember when I left prison, I I I started. I I called my brother and I said, "Hey, can you send me in some blue jeans?" And you know, I got a T-shirt. Like I'll wear a white. I need some blue jeans or tennis shoes, something. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's fine. He goes, what size do you wear? And I went, fuck, man, I don't know. I mean, I've lost so much weight. I went from 185 down to like 150. And I was like, I don't know, Mark. I don't know. And he goes, yeah, you know what? He goes, it's okay. He said, I know your measure. I, I know how tall you are and what you weigh. I'll ask, tell uh, my, you know, his daughter, my niece. He goes, she'll, she'll grab you some. He goes, we'll go to Walmart. We'll grab you some pants. I said, okay, no problem. So he sent in a size 30 or 20, I want to say 28 or 20, maybe it was a size 30, it's probably a size, let's say a size 30. And I remember when I got them and I saw that they were size 30, when I, and this was when I got them in the, I went, I was in the, um, where was I? I went to R, what's called R&D, receiving and departure. So when I went to R&D and I saw the pants and they were size 30, I thought, fuck, I'm going to have to wear my sweatpants. I put on the size 30, I shit you not, I could have put on a size 28 waist. I was that small. I had no, I put them on, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to need a belt. Like, this is ridiculous how thick, like, it wasn't that bad, but they were, they were loose. Uh, and I remember thinking, ah, I'm going to gain some weight, it's fine, it'll be fine. So, but what happens is you have to pack up all your stuff. And go to R and D. You get a you. So and let, let me jump, let me jump back. So I told my mother I was leaving on a certain date, which was going to be like sometime in. It was like in in October. I was supposed to leave in October. So when I wrote, I I, I got the form and I sent it off to my. You have to continually contact talk to your your um, counselor about doing stuff like, hey, I need to get money sent in or, hey, I need to arrange for a ride or, hey, you know. So I ended up going to my counselor and the coordinator that releases you. And at some point I went there and I said, hey, listen, I need to get my ride approved. They they have to approve the people that come to see you because – like, I guess they just, I don't know why. I don't know why. It doesn't matter. It's so stupid because, like, you could basically have anybody pick you up and then drive down the street and all your buddies could jump in the car, and which people do. But my my brother was coming to get me, and my brother and my, my brother and my sister-in-law and my mom were coming. And, but I think my sister-in-law wasn't approved, so I was trying to get her approved. So I kept going to the council going to the counselor and going to the coordinator and saying, hey, look, my sister-in-law, I need to know because I don't want her to show up and me not be able to get in the car with her. And she was like, yeah, yeah, well, there's plenty of time. I was like, no, there's not. Like, I'm, I'm leaving on, you know, on Tuesday. And the, the coordinator looked and she goes, you're not leaving for a couple more months. And I went, what? And she goes, yeah. She said, I went, no, I'm leaving October, whatever it was, you know, October 12th or whatever and she went no no wait a second she pulled it up she goes no you're not leaving until uh january 9th 
And I was like, what? She said, yeah, you're leaving January 9th. And I went, no, I, I, and I explained it to her and I said, I, I go, I can show you the paper. And she goes, hold on. She goes, oh yeah, it got changed. Well, nobody told me that. My mother thinks she's coming to see me next week. And, and she's like, no, oh no, no, she's, no, she's not because trust me, that's, that's not, yeah. So yeah. Oh, well, sorry. I mean, listen. You know, not. I didn't give a shit, really. I didn't care about staying in a few more months. Like that, that didn't mean anything to me. But you know, the fact that that you know, I told my my ninety year old mother at that time. I think she was ninety or ninety one. Told my ninety year old mother that I was, you know, and every time I talked to her, when are you coming? When are we coming to pick you up? When are you? Know, it'd been like that for over a month. So now I got to tell her, hey, look, at, I'm sorry. This is what happened. You know, there's so many people at the halfway house, they pushed a bunch of people's dates back. And so a few more months go by. At least by that point, I did have some clothes sent in, which was great. Um, you know, I, I pack up all my stuff. I go to R&D. You know, you go early in the morning. You know, I go to r and I had to drag all my stuff to R&D, which was I had so much legal work. And just, you know, legal work, books, just tons of stuff that I wanted to bring. And I had mailed a bunch of stuff home already. So I'm dragging it there. And I remember I got to R&D. And, you know, the COs in R&D can't work with inmates. Like that's how you end up in R&D because you've had so many problems dealing with, uh, with inmates or just people in general that uh, – that, that you end up working in a place where all you do is paperwork. So I get there and I say, hey, I'm here. What, you Cox? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm Cox. And they, all right, yeah, uh, st st Cox, go over there. You're like, all right. So you go over there, you stand there, you wait, you wait. They strip search you because they don't want you to s sneak anything out of the prison. Because apparently we've got great stuff in the prison. We want to sneak out of the prison. Then they go through all of my stuff. Now, I've got tons of stuff. It took me two trips to get to R&D. Well, I had to drag stuff across the compound. So if you want to know how large a compound is, imagine like a city block. Like, I mean, it's like a large park in the middle of the compound. So I have to drag all my stuff. Then I have to drag it back, another load. Um, and so I finally get to R&D. And so they look through all my stuff. And I go, okay, and then I'm sitting there, and they're like, all right, and then they wait, and they wait, and then they come back, and then they, they, they fingerprint you again. They give you another DNA. Um, I <laughs> remember the guy in front of me. They, they make you, they make you, this is funny, they make you tell your chart, like, what your charge is. They're like, uh, Cox, uh, uh, what's your reg number? <laughs> you know, 40171-018. Uh, they're like, all right. Uh, what are your charges? And I go, it's, you know, fucking bank fraud, wire fraud, money laundering, passport fraud, identity theft. I said, I, you know, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, financial institution fraud, uh, government document fraud. And, and I go, social security fraud. He goes, all right, Jesus Christ. He goes, all right. Um, so I remember you, you do all that and you're waiting. And then the, I remember there was a guy, another guy with me. And they go, okay, what's this? And so they name they uh, they talk to him a little bit, and he gives them their reg number. And then he goes, what's your charges? He goes, man, you know what my charges are, man. And he goes, now nah, what are your charges? And the guy ends up saying, and you know this is a guy who I'm sure the entire time he was in Coleman had been telling everybody he was there for something else, and he was like, child pornography. And he goes, speak up, speak up. He has to tell him like child. I'm not gonna say it because I don't want the algorithm, but child whatever. And he tells him what it was. You know, he had some bad stuff on his computer, and um, and I just remember thinking like I'd never really talked to the guy, but I just remember thinking, wow, like I never, I wouldn't have guessed it. <laughs> like I thought he were here for, 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 I thought he was here, I thought he was there for like drugs or something. You know, he didn't look the type. So and the guy was like, yeah, all right. And so he stands there. So then I, it, he goes, I remember he went, his family showed up first, so he left or whatever. He was going to a bus station or wherever, and they took him. And then in like 30 minutes later, then, then I go. Like they were like, hey, Cox, your, your, uh, your family's here. 
And then they're all like, you know, who's coming to get you? What what are their names? It's like, man, cut the shit. Like, let me go. So I tell them, and then they go, okay. Well, R&D is a detached building from the front of the prison. Like, there's multiple layers of security. And so I have to go from R&D. I have to go, like, it's like 400 feet to the next building. And I went, all right. And I grabbed some of my stuff. I said, I'll have to come back for that. And he goes, he goes, no, you ain't coming back. I said, yeah, bro, that's my legal work. I have to come back for it. And I said, I can't carry it. He goes, you got to carry it all at once. And I go, like, I mean, we're talking about like, like four, we have like four duffel bags. Like I can't, I can't drag these. Like, and the duffel bags, they're not even duffel bags. Like there's like a duffel bag. And then I ended up having, I ended up having like a, a, a couple laundry bags. Like you can't drag them. They'll tear. They're shitty laundry bags. And I went, no, I can't. I said, well, then I need to borrow one of these dollies. And they have those big bins, you know, where you can throw clothes, you know, that are like a big square made of canvas with wheels. I'm like, well, I'll have to borrow one of these. They go, you you ain't taking that. And I went, what am I supposed to do with my legal work? And he goes, we can chuck it. We can throw it away. And I went, I'm not throwing it away. It's my legal work. I'm still fighting a lawsuit. I'm not, I'm not doing that. And he goes, well, then you're not leaving. I said, well, then I won't leave. I said, tell my family to leave. I'll stay. And he goes, well, you're going to stay in the shoe? I said, I'm like, I ain't never fucking been to the shoe. I said, I've been to the shoe like three or four times. I said, I'll go to some shoe time. I don't care. I'm not leaving away without my shit. And he sat there and he was like, all right, we'll grab that bin, load it up. I ain't helping you load it in the bin. It's like, you know, there's such pricks. So you got to you throw it in the fucking bin, and I throw it in the in the bin, and then we wheel it out, wheel it out to the car. You know, you got to go through multiple layers. Like there's a sally port, they buzz you in one door, they buzz you out the other. You know, they check you, they look at your ID again, they ask you who you are again, what's your reg number. It's just like, oh my god, like I'm with two guys here. So get all the way to the front. My brother's there. Hey, what's up? And, um, you know, obviously I hug my brother, we grab my stuff. They won't let me take the bin outside the front. So my brother and I have to take my bags. <laughs> what the hell? So, um, I end up going, my mom's in the car and, uh, it's, you know, uh, she's by this point she had had a stroke. And so she couldn't walk. And the last probably year she was, probably the last year to two years she was coming to see me. She was coming to see me in a wheelchair. And so obviously I see her, I hug her, I get in the back of the car and pack all my stuff in and we're driving. Um, and I remember... This happens to me every fucking time I tell this fucking story. I remember being in the back of the car and driving. And the prison was, you know, it's getting small. And I can see it for the first time. Well, not for the first time. Like, I think I'd seen it from a bus before. And, you know, I'd seen it. But, like, it's it's getting further and further away. And uh, I can see it. And you're, you know, and there's like multiple layers of the prison. There's, you're, you're, as you're, you drive down a long street and there's signs and there's this and there's this prison. You can see the girls' prison and you can see the other prisons. You can see the pen. And so you're driving, you get all the way out of the complex and you pass the thing and you're driving. And you can kind of tell where you're passing, where the prison is, where they're, where they're, the, the, whatever the lands that they own. And I remember my brother saying, um, because I remember I was, it was so quiet in the car. Like, I don't think anybody knew what to say. But I was sitting in the back seat with my mom. And my brother was in the front seat. And my sister-in-law was in the, is in the other seat. And we were driving. And it was just real quiet. I was kind of looking at the prison. And uh, I started tearing up. And I remember my brother, I, I guess he was looking at me in the rearview mirror. And he said, well, I get your, I guess, uh. Because you're glad to be, see that place, or you're glad to be leaving that place, huh? And I was like, yeah. I, I just think I shook my head, but I remember thinking, it seems weird to be saying this, but it's not like I was 
like relieved to be leaving as much as I was sad because there were so many people that I liked there. It's like all the friends that I had were in that prison. You know, I have a, a friend named Pete. God, you know, there's there's you know there's a guy named Donovan Davis. There's um, you know, there's tons of guys. Uh, Jesus, there's a guy named uh, Dennis Caroni, uh, which I can't stand. But you know, I'm I I I saw him every day and we hung out and God, he was irritating. And uh, but you know, I I I knew I was gonna miss all those guys, and I felt horrible that I was leaving and I knew they were still there. And, you know, it's survivor's guilt, I think, that, you know, you, I don't know. Anyway, I uh, I just felt bad. Hold on. So it's it's just survivor's guilt, I think, from, you know, you make it through something and you feel bad for the people that you have to leave behind. Um, yeah, so we drove and I remember my brother said, you know, are you hungry? It was probably 10 or 11 o'clock. And I think they give you like, it's funny. They give you like an hour and a half, like Coleman's an hour and a half from Tampa. And they give you an hour and a half to get to, to the halfway house. And I've known guys that have taken like two or three hours to get there when they had like an hour and a half and they showed up, you know, three hours later. They stopped and ate, and they're like, oh, what are they going to do? You know, I'm just going to show up. I'll be there today. They get there, and they violate them immediately and send them back to prison. So, well, they don't send them back to prison. They actually put them in, like, a, a, a holding facility in the county. The county has a holding facility for people that violate for the feds. They'll hold them there for two or three months, go in front of the judge, and the judge will send them back to prison. And then they'll do some more time in prison and go back to the halfway house. They'll be back in six months because they were late. Uh, so I knew I had like an hour and a half. I might've had two hours. Anyway, I remember driving and I, we drew or my brother drove me there and we drove and we, we were going and my brother said, uh, what do you want? You know, what do you want to eat? You want to stop and get something to eat? And I was like, yeah, I want to. And I, I remember I'd been thinking about this because people ask you a lot when you're leaving, like, what do you want to eat? What do you, what's your first meal going to be? And, you know, guys are always like, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to get a steak and I'm going to get this. And, and I, I just wanted a, 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 a cheeseburger from McDonald's. So, like, a cheeseburger. And I don't mean a big cheese, like a little little kid's cheeseburger and French fries and a Coke, a fountain Coke. Because I hadn't had fountain Coke in, like, forever. So, anyway, we went to McDonald's and they were still serving lunch. I mean, it's still serving breakfast. They were still serving breakfast, so I couldn't get that. So then we pulled over, and we went to, like, a, a CVS or something, and I think or something like that, like a, a drugstore, maybe Walgreens or something. And I pull, we pulled into a Walgreens, and I got a Ben & Jerry's uh, pistachio ice cream. And so I ate the pistachio ice cream on my way to the halfway house. We got to the halfway house, went in the halfway house. Dragged all my stuff in the halfway house. Left some of it in my car, in my brother's car. Went in the halfway house. They then searched all my stuff. Uh, that, that I get because they want to make sure that you, they want to make sure that you're not sneaking in drugs into the halfway house. And the halfway house is just like a prison. There's not as many layers of security, but they still, the people that they run it worse than a prison in, in, a, in a very real way. Because they're searching you constantly. The great thing about prison is, in federal prison, you don't really have to have any inter interaction with any staff members or guards, you know, correctional officers or anything. Like you can go months and months without ever talking to them. You're basically on your own. You know, they they announce it's time to eat, and the door is open. You go to eat. You know, you go through the whole thing. You eat. You put your plate up. You leave. You know, they might search you when you leave randomly. But if you walk out and you're in a t-shirt and a and a pair of, you know, pair. Of, you're, you're in your uniform, slacks, and a t-shirt, and you don't even look like you could possibly. They're not going to search you. They search guys that are walking out with, like, two jackets on who are, you know, and look like they got something. Like, oh, I'm going to search this guy. So I, I almost never got searched. Um, 
you know, you just have very, there's no real need to, for interaction. So anyway, I leave and I go to the halfway house. These people search my bags. They give me a piss test immediately. And I know tons of guys that have on the way to the halfway house, got stoned, got to the halfway house, failed a piss test. They immediately violate them and send them to the county. They sit there for three months, get in front of a judge, judge them back to jail for six months. Then six months later, they come back to the halfway house for a month or something. Inmates are idiots. Like, I mean, they really are stupid. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because 50 million wasn't enough and 60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. But like, so I, I'm i in the halfway house. The halfway house is set up. There's probably maybe 100 people in the halfway house. It was, I went to the one on Hillsborough Avenue in Tampa, Florida, and it was it's run by the Goodwill. So the Goodwill runs, they have a contract with the federal government to run a halfway house. Maybe six months to a year prior to me getting there, you were they allowed you to have a cell phone. Wasn't allowed a computer. You're allowed a cell phone. So, and they have to check your cell phone on a regular basis. They'll check it. They'll check it randomly throughout the week. You, they have a list, and suddenly they call you. You bring your cell phone here. You bring your cell phone. They pop it open. They check it, and they check it every time you come in and leave the facility. It's outrageous. They and they they scroll through your stuff. Like they'll go through all your pictures. Like there will be people that will take pictures in the halfway house. They'll give them a shot. If they do it again, they'll they'll violate them. They don't want pictures in, inside the halfway house. There were guys that guys would take a selfie in like the bathroom of themselves, and they would find that and that's it. Oh, that's it. It's like bro, I'm I'm in the bathroom. It's like me, and you can see the mirror. Like you can't see any. Doesn't matter. So, search my stuff. Give me a piss test. I'm fine. Um, they put me in a room with, it's got eight beds in it. Most of the rooms have about eight beds. And eight to, I think some of them, some of them have like 12, 10 or 12. Anyway, so they're like 100 people. So I go into one of the rooms and they have men and women there too. That's another thing you'll get violated for. A lot of guys will hook up with the girls. You can't really hook up with them because you're you're just being watched all the time. But they'll maybe they'll go on a, like a, they'll both leave to go to I'll explain it and they'll they'll hook up outside or something. Somebody they'll find out. Bam, violated. Um, so I go in. I end up getting get into a room. It's an eight man room. It's me and seven black guys. And I had actually been in prison with a couple of the black guys, right? Because guys are coming from all over. Like you might be in California, but your release state or your release area or um, district is is in Florida. And you end up at a halfway house in Tampa, even though you did all your time in California or Oregon or wherever. You end up in, uh, in there. But I happened to be, I was with a couple of the guys that were there. So I walk in. They're like, what's up, Cox? How's it going? I'm like, what's up? Um, so that was cool. I have my, my, my bunk, which was not a great bed, but compared to a prison bed, it was great. Uh, you get, you get one, you get one locker. You have to put all your stuff in the locker. What a pain that was. Uh, to try and just literally half my locker was completely filled up with just like paperwork, books. Um, so I remember I got to the halfway house and as soon as I walked in the front door, so like I was still waiting like to wait for them to bring me back to do the, the urinalysis. I was waiting and I remember I looked probably up, maybe it was probably 75 feet maybe a hundred feet away. Cause it's a big room. They call it the day room. It's this really just big open bay room and all the women's, the women's rooms are on one side. And I want to say there's probably four women's rooms with eight beds a piece in those rooms. And then the rest are on the, are the guys rooms on the other side. So 
So maybe there's 35, maybe 30 women and 70 guys, something like that. Maybe less women. But I remember I looked across and I saw this chick sitting with another woman and some somebody else, some guy. And there's a bunch of tables there. Like there's a bunch of couches. As soon as you walk in, there's a bunch of couches and, TV, and a TV. Just past that, there's a bunch of little circular tables with maybe four chairs around them. There's probably 10 of those, maybe 12. And there's also a TV there. And then to the left of that is a hallway that leads to where they dispense um, medication and the kitchen. And then on the right side is an area where they have a class, like it's like a, it's like a, a very a miniature version of art app, of like a drug treatment class. So I get there to the halfway house. I look over and I see Jess, which is the chick I'm I'm currently. I'm currently because you know just currently, um, she'd love that. So uh, th- um, my girlfriend that I I uh, live with, I saw her in the halfway house. So I saw her with this other woman, and somebody else, some other guy, and I saw her, and I I remember looking at her and thinking just like, like I got to get me one of them. Um, so. But I remember sitting there in the halfway house and thinking, while I was sitting there, I was like, there are three things I need to work on. One is I've got to get a vehicle. Two, I got, well, I got to get a job first. Then I got to get a vehicle. And at some point in the future, I got to get one. I got to get a girlfriend. Um, and I had no, I have no phone. Like you have no idea. You just have nothing. You have all these things you need to do and you need to acquire. And I had nothing. I did have a few hundred dollars. Like I think I had like three hundred dollars. I actually had was had prided myself that I was going to get out of prison with no money, none. Like I expected to walk out with like twelve cents on my books. Like I was telling everybody, they were like, well, "Where are you going to work?" I would go, "Well, I'm going to try and get a job." But I mean, if I if I don't get a job in a you know, I'll apply it some places, but I'm out of a job within a few days or a week, then I'll go work at McDonald's. And everybody was like, man, you ain't going to work at McDonald's. And I'm like, yeah, I am. So I, I, I want to work at my, I wanted to work at McDonald's because I remember thinking I want to work at McDonald's so that for the rest of my life, people could, you know, and I heard somebody complaining. I could say, listen, bro, I got out of prison and worked at McDonald's for six months. And then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. So I don't want to hear how hard your life is or how you're not happy with your, you know, your current job or whatever. You don't like it, change it, you know? Like I've, I started at the bottom, nothing. A pair of blue jeans, some sweatpants, 300 bucks in my bank, or my, well, I wanted like no money in my bank account working at McDonald's. And McDonald's gives you a uniform, right? So like you can go there and get a uniform. Like I didn't need anything. You don't need anything. McDonald's is geared toward you starting with nothing. So I was excited about it. Uh, like I, I looked at the whole thing as like an adventure, right? Like it's like this is all an adventure. Like it's it's fun. Like the worst that happens is I go back to prison. Um, and I remember thinking I was going to bust my I was I have no problem busting my ass for a year straight. Like I'll do nothing but work and and save my money and make it a game make a game out of it. Well, it ends up what ends up happening is. I pick up the phone. I thought, but you know, obviously I'm going to try and get a regular job first. I'm going to make that attempt, but who's going to hire me? So I go to, they have pay phones in the halfway. You don't even have have cell phones. They got pay phones, right? You know, I don't have a cell phone. So I go to the pay phone, pick up the phone and I had the phone. I I look up or I get the phone number to Calta's gym, which was funny because it was one major road away from where I was. I was on Hillsborough Avenue, and one major road over is Waters Avenue. So I knew that the gym was about about two miles from the halfway house, which just just a fluke. And I had grown up with some guys, a guy named uh, Trent Calta, Treon Calta, and Troy Calta, and their father owned a bunch of gyms, the gyms that I worked out as a teenager 
And into my 20s, when I was in college, I worked out there all the time. And I grew up with these guys. And we were friends. Like, I was best friends with Trent Calta. But Trent, I knew, wasn't really – he was like a personal trainer now. Treon was running the gyms. So I called the gym – and said, hey, my name's Matt Cox. And and it's funny because the the woman that I that answered the phone, she's like, oh, Matt, yeah, I know who you are. Yeah, you're a friend of Trion's. What's going on? I said, well, look, can you tell him I'm in the halfway house? And, you know, obviously she knew. She must have known something. I could hear it in her voice like, oh, wow. Oh, I'm um, okay. Hey, Matt. So I could tell. Uh, and I was like, hey, can you tell Trion I'm in the halfway house? And And she goes, you know what? She said, let me... Um, she said, yeah, I will. Do you have a phone number? I said, yeah, you can call the phones back. Like the, the pay phones you could actually call back. So I gave her the number and she said, I'll call him on his cell phone, let him know. And I'd say maybe 20 minutes later, the phone rang, I picked it up. Um, or maybe somebody else got it somehow or another. I picked, I ended up on the phone with him. I was like, Hey, what's up? And he said, what's going on? What are you doing? Where are you? Where are you? I said, I'm at the halfway house on Hillsborough Avenue. And he goes, I said, you know, at the, uh, at Goodwill. And he goes, Whoa, bro. He said, um, what do you need anything? And I went, I actually, you know, I hate to say this, but I, I do. I, I need a job. I said, I need to save up some money to get a car. And he went, um, I said, I don't have a vehicle. I don't really have a way to get there. I could probably take the bus. He goes, nah, bro. He said, uh, um, he said, I'll give you a job. Of course, he said, I can't pay you much. Like, we don't, we don't pay anything. Like they pay like minimum wage. And he said, I, but, but I can run interference for you or with the halfway house. And I said, that sounds good. And what he meant by that was, you know, I can help you move around. Like I'll work with you in the halfway house. And so what ended up happening was I was scheduled to work 80 hours a week at the gym. So he picked me up every morning, almost always late, picked me up in the morning and dropped me. And then he would drop me off at night or someone would drop me off at night. And somebody picked me up. Like sometimes his wife would pick me up. Trion would pick me up. Um, other people at the gym would pick me up. You know, it's literally a mile or two away. So so he picked me up a couple days later. He Well, first I got I had to get him approved, right? Like you got to see your counselor and do all this stuff. And I have to pay while I'm in the halfway house. And you have to understand too that the halfway house takes like 30% of every, of your gross. So if I make $1,000, they take 300 a, a week. They take $300. Plus your, and then, then you, of course, you also have your taxes of 200, 300 bucks. So if you make a thousand dollars, you're lucky if you're, if it, if you're making $400 a week, if you make a thousand, which I didn't make a thousand, but what Trion did was he paid me minimum wage. He gave them my schedule saying I worked 80 hours a week and he paid me minimum wage, but he only paid me for maybe 40 hours. 40, maybe 50 hours. And for some reason, the halfway house never put it together that I was gone 80 hours. Plus they give you, they gave me like an hour. Well, they gave me 30 minutes to get there and get back. So I was scheduled for, I had got an, another hour every day. So I'm getting, I'm out of the halfway house. I think it was like 86 hours because I didn't work every day. Sunday I got off. So 86 hours a week is roughly what I was working with the, obviously the six hours is travel time when it doesn't take that long. But so I got 80, I was able to get out of the halfway house 86 hours a week. And they would call when I get there, you pick up the phone, you call. And when you're leaving, you call. And then they call randomly throughout the day. Every once in a while, they would call. Initially, the first month or two, they call like almost every day. Then it starts to trail off. And so, but he would pay me for like 40 hours, maybe 50 hours a week. But I was gone 80. And they never quite put it together that this guy is supposed to be working, but he's not He's not getting the money. There's just nobody to really make that. You know, they don't, that what they do is they, you get your, you get in your, you know, you get in your 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 paycheck. They sh- they want to see your paycheck, and then they want to. You okay? We'll go cash it and give bring us a cashier's check for the difference for the thirty percent. They okay? You got to make a copy. You fill out a form. The whole thing. Anyway, so a couple a few days later, maybe a week later, Trion picks me up, and he picked me up. And I remember, you know, we went. Obviously, the first day I remember was nothing but me just telling stories. 
nothing but guys showing up like friends. It's funny too how many friends I suddenly had. Like guys are showing up like, bro, what's up, man? It's me, Mike, man. What's going on? I'm like, I have no idea who this guy is. But apparently when you talk to him, we were best buddies growing up in high school and we were friends in college and, and I don't, I don't have any clue really who this person is. Like I, I, as he talked, I was like, I kind of think I remember meeting this guy, you know, and, and that happened quite a bit. Uh, I, Trent, uh, Trent, well, Trion's dad was there. So I talked to him and his girlfriend. Um, eventually Troy shows up. Um, Trion showed up. No, I'm Trion. I'm sorry. Trent showed up. Troy showed up. Trent was there. Like everybody shows up. So the first day or two is nothing but stories. And I was trying to say, I remember saying, I got to save up some money for a, a, a car or vehicle. And literally within maybe a week my ex-wife called me and told me that one of the stories for these guys that I'd gotten into Rolling Stone magazine, it was a story, it was a book, it was called, uh, the the short story I wrote was called, um, I called it uh, um, Orange, was it Oxy, Oxy Rush, Oxy Rush was the first one I wrote. And then I expanded it into a book and uh, it was called uh, Generation Oxy. And I had this. Uh, the, I had worked with a, a reporter that got it into Rolling Stone magazine. Wrote an article on Rolling Stone magazine, and the truth is, I wrote the article. And then at the last minute, the guy basically put his name on the article and really fucked me over. But ended up optioning it, and I so I got a piece of that option. Um, you know, which never really seemed fair to me. But I was in prison, and and. I don't, there wasn't much I could do. It was I wasn't given like much of, a, of an option, so uh, I got I got would get a check right, but I got a check and I got to get a check for like it was like a little over six thousand dollars, like maybe six thousand dollars, sixty two hundred something like that. And then so my ex wife calls or ends up calling me and saying, "Hey, listen." By this point, by the way, the second day of I was at the halfway house, I was allowed to leave, so I I left. I want to say I had four hundred dollars because I went to, I went to Walmart. My brother was allowed to pick me up, drive me to Walmart, and drive me back. And I bought three hundred dollars worth of clothes at Walmart. And I got like two pair of blue jeans, which I still have today, size thirty, waist. And I I got some black T-shirts and some white T-shirts. Um, and I got a pair of rubber boots and oh, what else? Socks, underwear, some hair care products. That's important. Still had my, my brush. I still have the, my brush from prison, from the medium, from the medium. I still have my brush from prison, from the medium right now in my thing. I need a new brush though, because some of the, you know, it's got the long bristles things, the long ones, and a couple of them have broken off. It's, it's time for a new, but still have it. I'm very frugal. Um, anyway, I got a bunch of stuff, deodorant, whatever, went to Walmart. So came back and had, I remember I had about a hundred bucks. That's got, I do remember that. I do remember after I went to Walmart, I had about a hundred bucks left. So anyway, Probably a week or so later after going to the gym, my ex-wife calls me on my cell phone and said, you've got a check here. And I went, really? And she went, yeah, you got a check here because she had been getting the checks from the other th- from the other uh, options. And I go, how much is it? And she goes, um, hold on. And she looked at it and she's like, oh, it's, you know, $6,300 or sixty two, whatever it was. And I was like, are you fucking serious? They optioned, they optioned the movie again or the, the 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 rights to this the life rights to uh this kid's story again and i went i was just like whoa i was able to take that money i was able to go open up a bank account at wells fargo bank deposit the check put my hundred dollars in there and applied for a secured credit card so I got a secure credit card for like 300 bucks from Wells Fargo. 
because I had to build up my, I wanted to build up my credit. And I did that. And, um, and I took the money and I went and I want to say it was like 24, 2,500 bucks, 2,600 bucks. I bought a Jeep Liberty, a Jeep, like, right. It's like a chick Jeep. So I bought this chick Jeep and I was able to drive back and forth to work. Oh, and I got a year's worth of insurance. So I got a year's worth of insurance. And when I was in prison, I had gotten my driver's license while I was in prison because they have something, they call it the flow bus, right? The It's the Florida Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, transportation, but whatever, where they go to prisons and you can get a driver's license. So I had to take a test, had to go. I took the test, not the driving test. Obviously you're in prison. They don't like them. Let me drive. So, but I took the test, got my picture taken and I had a driver's license and the picture on my driver's license that I have to this day is the picture that I took in prison. Still same picture, same thing. So, um, yeah, so I had a driver's license. I, had, I, I got, um, I got insurance, got a car, super thrilled, able to drive to work and back and, uh, started flirting with Jess. You know, she was helping me with my, uh, with my phone. I start going and I start sitting down at the table with her. So in the morning, I wake up, you know, in the morning, I wake up, I wake up, I go get my food, my, my, my free meal, my free, you get several free meals. You get free meals and then you got meals you can pay for. And Aaron wasn't thrilled at the idea of paying for a meal because they take 30% of everything you make and that includes your meals. But if you want extra stuff, like you're like, yeah, hey, here's your, we're giving serve a meatloaf for, for dinner tonight, but you can also, if you want, you can buy a hamburger. Or you can buy this or buy that. And so guys start spending their money on that. And that just seemed ridiculous. Like I'm already paying 30%. Which to be honest, for three meals and a roof over your head, 30% of your salary is not really a bad deal. Even though everybody complained about it, it's not a bad deal. The problem was they felt like, hey, I'm still in prison. Because what people don't understand about the halfway house is, at least the one in Tampa, you'll talk to other guys who'll say, that's not what a halfway house is like. Listen, bro. I don't know what your halfway house is like on your state crime with your state halfway house in your nice, plush, liberal state. But this was a federal halfway house in a very conservative district. And I can tell you right now, you are allowed to go to work and back. You're not going to dinner with your family. My family wanted to visit me. They had to come to the facility. I, you're allowed if you have to go buy something you're allowed you where are you going what's the address you have to fill out a form they have to okay it and they'll tell you who's picking you up okay we're giving you 15 minutes to be there you have one hour and 15 you have, you'll have to be back here in an hour and a half 15 minutes there an hour to st- spend in the store so it better not be crowded and 15 minutes to get back or we violate you and they love to violate people love it like it, it, and you're being counted three, four times a day. It, it's it's really ridiculous. Really, really bothered me when they would count us in the middle of the night. They they could just they would shine the light in your face and wake you up at two in the morning. You're like, are you serious? Like this is a halfway house, and there's only one way in and one way out. Like nobody snuck out. Nobody's escaping from the halfway house. Do you know why? Because if I got up and walked out the front door, they don't have permission to physically stop me. So I don't have to. I don't have to climb up in the rafters and and saw my way through through the roof and sneak out so that I have an extra two hours of time and jump the fence and get by the guard tower. Like, I can walk out the front fucking door. You're not going to stop me. You're not even allowed to stop me. So why are you counting me, us, at one in the morning? Anyway. Okay. So I end up buying the car. I get the thing, get the whole thing, see Jess, start flirting with Jess. Because every once in a while, you know, I'm sitting there. And the first time I, I ate, there was this this woman that was there. Her name was uh, Tina. Uh, Tina is, you know, like, she's insane. I mean, she really is insane. Like, um, not sure what to believe. Any, or not, no, that's not true. I know not to believe pretty much anything she says. Like she, when I asked her, so we sat down, we were sitting there and Tina's massive. She's a, she's got to be six, over six foot tall. And so I see my girlfriend, Jess, Jess has got like one arms tatted out, um, brown hair, weighed a buck, 
I'm gonna say she weighed a buck fifty-five, right? And she's like five six. She's my height. I think I'm taller than her, but whatever. That's you know, it's also probably partially a mental condition that I have. I feel I'm about half an inch to an inch taller than her, but whatever. So she's about she's we're both about five six. She's one fifty, probably my weight at that point. By that point, I was starting to gain some weight. Like I've been eating. Um. In the halfway house, I got up to like one. When I left the halfway house, it was probably 165. So Jess is probably 150, 155. And, you know, we're sitting there. Tina sees me. And this is, by the way, this is like the white table. So everybody else is either Hispanic or black. And then you have like one table of the whites. Because even though it's a halfway house, it's still much, like I said, it's really a prison. And so guys are still clicking up. So, and there were, there would be like a black guy would sit at our table or a Hispanic guy or something like that. No big deal. Like nobody cares. But for the most part, I'm sitting at like the white table. So I sit there with, um, with Tina and Jess and there were these two other guys. Uh, one of the guys I called Snowden cause he looked just like a uh, Snowden. Um, and he was super good with computers too. Like he would help you with your phone and stuff. He didn't want to help me by the way. He hated me. He hated me. There were a couple other white guys that were there. They hated my guts. Um, because as soon as I got there, somebody obviously had said, this guy cooperated. Like, this guy got 26 years. He just got out of prison. He cooperated. Like, you know. And I knew that rumor was going around. And the other thing that happened was, as soon as I got there, the COs, or COs, whatever they call them, they, they knew me. And so they started watching. It slowly went around where everybody was watching American Greed. I had been on a program called American Greed. So they're watching American Greed. And so I remember walking by this one counselor. He was a counselor. And he walked by and he looked at me and I go, what's up? And he goes, saw you last night. And I went, what? He said, yeah, watch your show. And I go, what show? And he goes, American Greed. And I said, man, I said, who else? Who else has anybody else seen that? He goes, oh, everybody's seen it. Everybody's seen it. He said, we all, we all, we've all seen it by now. And I was like, okay. And so then one day, a couple days later, I remember walking where the couch area was and I'm walking by and there's a guy sitting there watching the American greed on his phone. So, and keep in mind, I got a phone, I got a, like an $80 cheap, real cheap Android phone for like 80, 90 bucks. So I get the phone and I downloaded some app that lets you get free. Uh, you, you got to watch free movies. But I, I must have gotten a virus or something on it. Like everybody's like, oh, you were watching a porn site. I wasn't going, I wasn't watching a porn site. It was, it was, I think it was this one app. So I downloaded the app and it kept, my phone kept freezing up and just doing weird stuff. And it was a cheap phone too. So I would, I would ask Jess or I'd be like, Hey man, my phone's messed up. And I remember I would always ask this guy Snowden. Now the reason I asked Snowden was one, he was good with phones. And two, I knew he hated my guts, but there were multiple guys that hated my guts. And I would sit at the table and Jess always laughs to this day. She's like, you knew that Carl and Snowden hated your guts. And you would walk out with your tray. She says, I, I would watch you look at them, grin, and sit down at the table. Boom. What's going on, guys? And I just start eating. And you could just see it. that They would just, they did disgust. They, would, they didn't want to sit with me like, oh, this fucking guy. And I'd go, what's up? How's it going? And I'd stare at them. They'd be like, what's up, man? Like, they, you didn't even, like, you didn't have the courage to go, to not say anything, to not to say, man, fuck you, or man, don't talk to me, or nothing. Like they talk around you behind your back, but they don't even have the courage to say something to, to my face. So as a result, I constantly sat with them and tried to talk to them. I would talk to them. I talked to Je and Jess would sit there and grin because she knew she's like she's like I I was thinking to myself like does he know these guys don't like him? He's got to know. Like you can feel the tension, right? And I, I always joke, because I always say, yeah, like, well, I'm a con man. I've, I've got great intuition. Right? So I can feel when something's not right. Very intuitive. And so I would ask Jess to help me. Like, my phone kept freezing up. Like, it would freeze up, like, every day or two. And if Snowden was there, I had to ask somebody. So I asked Jess. And I remember Tina had, had, had said, you know, hey, oh, 
Tina talks with a real, a real thick accent. My head, my head. I do a great Tina too. I hope she doesn't see this. Um, it'd kill her because she, because in her mind she has me fooled. Like I remember with the story she told me why she was arrested. Tina said she was arrested because, man, I was running a a, a a large construction, a development company, and we we needed money. And so we asked some of the employees if they wanted to invest, and they invested some of their, they would empty out their 401k and give it to me. And because I didn't fill out the proper forms, I ended up getting charged with, with fraud, with wire fraud, and they gave me 10 years. Can you believe they gave me 10 years for that? No. No, I can't believe that a few guys gave you their their retirement and you simply didn't fill out the correct form and you got 10 years. Because the newspaper said you were running a fucking Ponzi scheme and that you were a pathological liar and that you continually lied and they couldn't believe anything that came out of your mouth and you spun them and spun them and spun them and you stole from your employees and your friends and family and lost a bunch of money. And then when the government came to introduce to talk to you, you lied to them too. And you lied and lied and lied, and as a result, you ended up getting 10 years. Roughly 10 years. It might have been 8, might have been 11. Whatever. I don't know. I don't know this, what this, the deal with this chick is. But she did, she did prison. She definitely went to prison for a, like a, a significant amount of time. Like it wasn't like two years, which some people would say two years is significant. But this was like, it was like she ended up doing like, like eight years. Seven and a half, eight years. So she had to have gotten like 10 years. Um, and she got like a year's worth of halfway house. Uh, a year worth of halfway house. So anyway, um, we're sitting there and I'm joking with Jess. And I remember joking with, saying to Jess one time, like, my phone's fucked up. And then she goes, okay. She goes, give me your phone. We looked at it and she went. And Jess was, by the way, at this point, Jess was. 32 years old? Yeah, she was 31 or 32. And and she looked at the phone and, and she goes, what's your password? And I told her what my password was. And my password ended with 69. It's like blah, blah, like whatever. You know, dog 69. And she goes, oh, 69, huh? She goes, you're one of those guys. And I went, no. I said, I don't know what that means. But I said, no, but... That's the year of my birth, 69. And she sat there, and she froze. And I could see the wheels moving, the calculations. And she looked at me, and she went, well, she goes, you're 50? I went, well, I'm 49. I'll be 50 in a few months. And she goes, you're 50? And I went, I'm 49. And she goes, I go, why? And I remember I had said, like, the guys in my room, right? Like, the guys in my room were always like, bro, that chick likes you. I was like, no, she didn't like me. She was just, she, they go, you eat, you eat all your meals with her. She's always coming up to you. You guys are always talking and laughing. She thinks you're funny. She, she likes you, bro. And I'm like, no, she don't like me. We're just, we're just white. So we're clicking up together because we're, we're both, we're, there's very few whites here. And, and, you know, these are a bunch of black guys. They go, nah, Cox. You don't understand. You've been locked up too long. You don't see the signs. You don't understand. That girl likes you. And I went, nah, nah, she don't like me. And so when Jess is looking at my phone, she goes, she looked at my phone and she went, so you're 50? I went, oh, I'm 49. She goes, and she went, I go, why? Does it matter? And she went, well, no, it's just that my 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 dad's like 50, 50, 53, 54. And I went and I remember thinking and keep in mind that I'm 18 years older than Jess. So I remember thinking to myself I was like like to me I was like, "Oh, okay, well what's the big deal?" And I thought, oh, "Wow. Like that's like she does like me because if you were friends what does it matter if I'm 18 years older than you? What does it matter if I'm 50? We're just friends. But as somebody you're prospectively thinking, 
this is someone I, I, I may like or want to hook up with or I'm interested in. Now your age makes a difference. And so, and she was like, no, I, it, it's just my dad's like 50, 53, some 54 or something. And I was like, okay. And she goes, I go, you know, she was like, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's nothing. So we, she helps me and everything. But at that point I remember thinking this chick likes me. She likes me for sure. So I remember I went back to those guys in my room. I was like, listen, what just happened? And I told them, they're like, Cox, I told you, man, I told you that girl likes you. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because 50 million wasn't enough and 60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So then, uh, yeah, so then I start text. Oh, now this is the other thing. Jess was texting me a couple times a day, three, four, five times a day. For the next day, no texts. The next day, I text her like twice, got one response. And I didn't get the long five or six email, five or six sentences response. I got the, I'm like, hey, what's going on? How's your day going? How's everything going? Fine. Like an hour later, I got the one, the one word response. Fine. Listen, no, no. You don't go from us going back and forth all day. I was like, oh, wow, okay. The 50, the 49. A 50-year-old thing, that bothers her. So then over the next week or two, she slowly started, you know. And, and then I started realizing, like, she has been flirting with me. And then at one point, she, I remember, I was at the gym and she texted me and she said, hey. And, but I didn't text her back right away. Because um, I was doing something and I didn't realize my phone had gone off. So by the time I was like 20 minutes later, by the time I checked it and she, and I, she had said, Hey, are you at the gym? Is it the one, the gym on waters Avenue? And I texted her back and I said, why? And she said, she's like, well, I was going to come by because she was coming back from her job. She worked as a, she worked as a, a, a maid at a, um, at a, at like a, 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 a motel. And so she took the bus back and forth. And so she was like, well, I, I got off work early and a, my bus stop isn't far from there. And I thought I might come by. And I was like, well, come by. And she's like, no, I can't because it's too late now. And I've got to catch the bus. If I don't miss this, this bus, then whatever, I have to walk here. I have to do this or whatever. It's a whole thing where she had like a 30 minute window that where she could have come by and seen me. And all I could think about was like, why are you coming by to see me? Why are you risking coming by and seeing me? And when I was like, what that night, like when I saw her, I was like, why, you know, why would you, why were you going to come by and see me? She's like, no, 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 I just, I was thinking about you. And I was like, you were, I said, well, like what? And she goes, I was just, I go, you think about me a lot? And she was like, I think about you sometimes during the day. I think about, you know, I was just going to stop. I wanted to see the gym. I wanted to see the gym. And I just was like, no. No, no, there's something else is going on here. And she was like, no, nothing else. I go, yeah, yeah, you like me. You like me. And she's like, no, I don't like you. I don't think of you like that. I'm like, nah, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm a con man. I have very good intuition. I'm telling you right now, you dig me. You dig me. And she's like, I, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't dig you. Not interested. She goes, I make fun of guys like you. Like, I don't date, girls like me don't date guys like you. You have to think Jess was raised in... She was right. Her whole family has worked for like the dairy industry. So they, they work, you know, they work on these dairy farms and dairy farms are, are, listen, it's backbreaking work. Most of the dairy workers are, are Mexicans are like illegal Mexicans. And so her family, she's not Mexican, but you know, her family works like her sister, like raises calves, her father, um, breeds uh, breeds cows. You know, uh, Jess works in the factory. Um, you, you know, her brother works maintenance. Um, her mother was a milker. You know what I'm saying? Like they work, they work these factories. Now they don't all work there now, but they come and go. Her father still works there, and they come and go. Um, but basically, they she grew up in the and, and on the on these large farms, they have houses for the employees. 
So you'll, you can rent a house. And so she grew up in these dairy houses. So this is, this is, this is, these are not soft, nice, well manicured um, areas where these places are. These are, are, you know, dirt roads. It's a rough area. Like she grew up very poor. And, um, so she was like, you know, listen, we, I, she's like, girls like me make fun of guys like you. She's like, you don't hunt, you don't fish, you don't, you don't own, you don't own a truck. You don't like, she's like a cow girl, you know, she's like a, 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 a farm, you know, a farm girl. Um, she's like a redneck. And so anyway, she, she was like, and I was like, no, no. But I told her, I said, no, I said, you, you, you like you some city boy. That's what it is. You like, you like me. Anyway, um, she ended up leaving. Oh, this was funny too. This was funny. This is classic. You'll like this. This is so sad. I remember she said, we were sitting at the table one day and and one of the guys was talking about hooking up with some girl. How they had met, like some girl was, you know, whatever. They he'd met her and they met in the parking lot or something. He's like, Yeah, man, like, like I we were we've been meeting like for lunch and this and that and she works near me and and so it was like, Oh, okay, that's great, that's great. And I think it was a Bobby. Anyway, so we were talking and I remember um Tina said to said well, uh, Matt, have you are you are you looking for anybody? Are you thinking about dating anybody? And of course, you know I'm in the halfway house. Like, who's gonna date me in the halfway house? Like, I'm like, no, not really. I said, and she goes, well, what kind of girl do you like? And she goes, I work in an office. Like, I might know somebody. And I went, I mean, what kind of girl do I like? I said, I'll be honest with you. I said, I I. Like uh, the kind of girls that I like, and I said honestly, it's not what you expected. She goes, "What's that?" I said, "You know, like I I like a chick with tattoos. You know, like maybe she's got some tattoos. She's a little rough around the edges. She's like a tomboy, or you know, maybe a stripper. Maybe she's a stripper. Maybe she's been married a couple times, got some kids. I don't know. Like I just that's my I kind of like that rough around the edges kind of. And so as I'm talking, Jess glances up at me." And a couple of guys, everybody starts to glance over at Jess. And Tina goes, well, what about Jess? And I went, Je and she goes, what about Jess? And Jess looks at me and I went, I'll be honest with you. I said, Jess is about, I said, Jess is about 20 pounds away from being dateable. And she went, and, and Jess goes, you think I need to lose 20 pounds? I said, no, I think you need to lose 30 pounds. But if you lost 20, you're dateable, and we'll talk about the other 10. And she goes, well, I think I'm fine the way I am. I said, right, so that's fine. It's no big deal. I get it. You like me. It's not going to happen. She says, I don't like you. I go, whatever, whatever. So so anyway, not long after that, and she was so irritated by that. She brings that up to this day. So what's so funny about that, anyway, is that literally, you have to understand, she left. So she le she gets on an ankle monitor. She goes home. And she was like, hey, I'm leaving tomorrow. Like, you know, like that's the kind of stuff she would do. She'd go, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be leaving tomorrow, right? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's good. That's good. You get to go home and stuff. She's like, yeah. And she's giving me the girly, glancy eyes, you know, the whole thing, the whole little flirtatious, like, you know, she's sad and, you know, and then what do you think about that? I'm going to miss you. She didn't want to say it, though. Anyway, she leaves. We keep texting. She gets home. Eventually, I leave. I end up leaving. So just before I leave the halfway house, I'm looking for a place to stay. So what I realized very quickly is that as a result of having a felony, nobody wants to rent to me. And I'm, I'm being honest with people. When I call them, I'm like, hey, I'd like to rent a place, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And then they say, are you, well, okay, so are you a felon? I am a felon. I'm in a halfway house. Said, yeah, okay, well, that's not going to happen. Click. Like that happened over and over again. So I'm having a real hard time. Tina ends up telling me she has 
a friend of her. No, she just built. She she because she was working for like a a company that does um, engineering, and she said that they had just put on like a a mother in law's quarters in these people's house that lived on Bayshore uh, Boulevard. So Bayshore Avenue, Bayshore, whatever. So it's a it's a nice it's a really nice area. So in Tampa. So she tells me that hey, these people travel like nine months out of the year and they need someone to house sit and they will let you rent uh, stay for free in the back if you'll just make sure you watch their house. You'll, they'll have your cell number. You can call them, let them know what's going on. Everything's okay. Make sure the sprinklers are running. Nothing breaks, whatever. I'm like, like that's a, that's a sweet deal. So I'm like super excited. So I basically stop looking. And I tell Tina, but I can feel something not right about Tina. Like I know something's not normal with this woman. Like her story doesn't make sense. You got 10 years because you filled out a form. You didn't fill out the right form. Like, stop it. That's not what I've been to prison. I know what's going on. You're a fucking con artist. So you bilked a bunch of people. You ran a little Ponzi scheme just like what you pled guilty to in federal court. And you went to prison. So she said, So she's saying all this stuff. And I keep telling her, I want to go meet these people. Like, I'd like to come by and meet. Oh, of course, of course. So she schedules a time where we're going to go meet. And I, I, at this point, I can leave work. Like, I've got it set up where, where Treon, we've got it set up with a halfway house where I have to go pick up gym equipment and pick up things for the gym. And I have to go to Sam's Club and pick up stuff for the gym for Cokes or not Cokes, but whatever, you know, energy drinks and towels and cleaning equipment. So I'm allowed, I can, I can leave for a couple hours here, a couple hours there. And I started being able to go to see my mother like twice a week. I would go see my mom twice a week, like on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning, I would go in, sign into the gym, leave for two or three hours and then come back. So, which was great. I mean, I appreciate Treon for, for arranging that for me. Um, of course, the, the, they have no idea that the halfway house had no idea where I was going. They think I'm going to driving, you know, I'm driving to go drop off equipment or get equipment welded. Like we had all kinds of excuses. And then I'd come back and Treon, if they called, they, he'd say, yeah, yeah, he's not here. He had to go do this. And you have to call in and tell him, hey, I'm leaving. Here's where I'm going. And then you call, hey, I'm, I'm back now. So I would see my mom. Anyway, so I had it arranged where I was like, hey, I can go see these people. Let's set up a thing. And she rescheduled several times. She was like, oh, man, they can't do it today. Uh, they extended their trip, but they're going to be back on Wednesday. Can you do it Wednesday? Yeah, I can do it Thursday. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it Thursday. Yeah, Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, whatever. It kept getting pushed back. And I was at the point where I was like, Tina, you don't seem to understand. Like, I'm leaving in, in a week. Like, I have to meet these people. And so it comes down to it where at the last minute I go to Tina and I say, the fuck is going on? And she goes, oh, man, I didn't want to tell you. I just found this out this morning. They don't want you to be. They want you to. They know me and we're friends and they want you to be there. But they talked to their son about it and their son looked you up and they said they don't want. He doesn't want you at his parents' house. I'm so sorry, Matt. And she tears up like she's going to she's going to start crying. And I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? The other reason I knew it was fucked up was because Tina would send me stuff that I was like, hey, Tina, what are you working on? And she would send me stuff like she would send me uh, she sent me one time a little like a little one bedroom, one bath schematic. Oh, this is what I'm working on right now. And she sends it to me. Well, then a month later, when it, she was telling me she had these people's little, this little house thing in the back, mother-in-law's quarters in the back near the pool that I could stay in. She sent me the same schematic that she'd sent me a month or two before. Oh, well, yeah, we designed their whole, the mother-in-law's quarters. It just got finished. It's brand new. Here's a picture of it. Boom. And she sent it to me. And I thought, boy, that looks familiar. And I check back a month or two, sure enough, it's the same one she sent me before. Where she wasn't working on that one, this was another one she was working on in a development. So it was like, 
I know she's like I already know she's lying because she also said that she was one of the girl one of the one of the models in in uh, John Palmer's is it John Palmer the guy who sings um, um, addicted to love it was a big song and they had a bunch of models that were dressed in black with slick black hair playing guitars she said she was one of the models so I went and looked up who all the models were she's not one of the models anyway. And when I asked her, I said, hey, you know, it's funny, Tina. I said, I looked up those models. Like, you're not one of them. She's, oh, well, see, I was like 15 years old, so they couldn't use my name. My aunt, they couldn't use my name. I was underage, so they just left me off. Listen, I've seen those models. I stopped that video. She ain't one of the models. I don't care, 15 or not, she ain't one of them. Anyway, the point is, now at the very last minute in the halfway house, I have nowhere to go. Just so happened that I had a friend, or I had a girl that I dated. I had a girl that I dated when when I was, I was uh, 19. Was I 19? Yeah, I dated for about a year. I dated from the age of 19 to 20. We lived together. Her name was Stacy. Stacy and I had always remained friends. In fact, I went to Stacy's wedding, um, and uh, actually ended up meeting a girl at Stacy's wedding, and then took her. Like a week later, I took her to, uh, I want to say, um, Acapulco uh, in Mexico, or was it Cozumel? Or... I don't know. I took her to Mexico for like uh, a week. Uh, her name was Christy. She was nice. She was a nice girl. Um, anyway, so I took, she's too tall. She was like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, like it's, it was never going to work. But the point is, is I took, like I meet her at Stacy's wedding. I remember too, Stacy sat me at the, she goes, look, I'm sitting you at a table with some of the bridesmaids. There's this one girl there. Her name her name is Christy. And I'm not going to say her last name. Her name is Christy. And Christy is a very nice girl, Matt. Don't get any ideas. Do you understand? I was like, of course I'm not going to get any ideas. I wouldn't do that. Did I ever tell you this story? Listen to this. So I remember, <laughs> I go, so I go with Chris, I go and I meet Christy and I flirt with Christy all night. We end up, I end up, we end up going for like after, the wedding towards the end, I go, hey, I go, let's get out of here. Let's go get some coffee. So we go to Starbucks and we get some coffee. She's in my car, right? I had, a, I had an Audi TT Quattro when they first came out, right? They were like 50, 60 grand. So it's like a $100,000 vehicle now. Anyways, super cool car. So shoot, now it's probably even more because cars are fucking outrageous. $40,000 vehicles now are going for $70,000. It's fucking crazy. So it's probably a $200,000 sports car now anyway point is we go to i remember we went to starbucks this is what a, this is so you're gonna love this we go to starbucks we eat at starbucks i mean not we eat, you know whatever we have some coffee and whatever a scone or something we i flirt you know really seriously with her we end up going back we get in my car um i drive her back to her car so she can get her car and go home we start making out and i remember and so she goes to get out of her car and she goes oh my god i can't find my keys I, she goes, oh my gosh, she goes, I put him in the in the chair at Starbucks. I go, shit, jump in the car, turn around, drive back to Starbucks, walk up. She's in the car. I walk up to Starbucks, knock on the door. There just so happens they're just like leaving. Everybody's just walking out the door. And they're like, yeah, what, what's going on? And, and I go, Did, I was here. There was a girl. And she goes, car keys. And I went, yes. And she goes and she gives me the car keys and hands them to me. And I go, thank you very much. And I walk. I put them in my pocket. I get in the fucking car. I start the car. And she goes, did they have them? And I go, Listen, here's what we can do. You can come back to my place. Or I said, if you feel uncomfortable with that, I said, I can I, I can I can rent you a hotel room or something. And she goes, I'm not gonna let you rent me a hotel room. Because she had like an hour to drive or something. I said, and what we do is we'll come back here tomorrow morning. So I said, or you can come to my place, stay at my place, I'll sleep on the couch. And I said, and we'll come back here early in the morning and, and when they open and get the keys. And she goes, She sat there and she goes, I can't believe I can't go home with you. She's I can't. And I go, well, I'll sleep on the couch. She goes, you're not going to sleep on the couch. And she goes, oh, my God. And she went, okay, look. She goes, let's just go back to your place. And I go, I reached in my pocket and I pulled out the keys. I said, now, listen, if I was a real scoundrel, <laughs> I said, I would not I said, I would have waited till we came back here the, tomorrow morning. I said, and I said they gave me the keys. I said, one of, I want brownie points for giving you these keys right now. <laughs> because I said, you don't know how much I want to find. I was hoping, 
I was listen. I was this close to being like, "Damn, that was easy." Like, I'm just gonna take this chick home. Like, what? It's it would be stupid to give her the keys now. But I thought, nah, you know what? You get some brownie points. So I gave her the keys, and she was like, "Oh my god!" She's like, "Stacy told me you were just a, a scoundrel. Like you're a horrible person." Like, I gave you the keys. And then, like a week later, I took her to, to, to fucking Mexico right, for like a week. And then maybe two, three weeks later, we broke up. Um, you know, but this wasn't gonna last. She's too tall. She was a giant. She was like five seven, five eight. She's she, that's she's that's huge to me. So um, anyway, I so then back to Jess. So let me tell you how I end up with Jess. Listen to this. This is good. So go back to Jess. I'm not so. Oh, at the, la, at the halfway house. I'm at the halfway house. So the last minute, I call Stacy, my ex girlfriend Stacy. I call her and I go. And Stacy had already told me if you need a place to stay, I have a spare room. And I went, oh my god. So I call Stacy and I go, hey, um, God, you're not gonna believe this. She goes, I have the room all waiting for you. Not gonna be a problem. I said. Are you serious? And she goes, I said, Stacy, it's so weird. Like, I feel really weird. You're there with your husband and your kids, and it's just so uncomfortable. And she goes, it's not going to be uncomfortable. It's not a big deal. She said, she actually, she listen, she, she, she was actually a nice place. And she, she said, I'm renting another room to a friend of mine who's going through a divorce who's a police officer. So there's a cop living in one spare room, and I'm living in the other spare room. And then her kids live in a couple. And listen, it's a, for for I, well, I'm gonna call it a rooming house. For a rooming house, it was a nice rooming house. Like this place is massive. She lives on two acres on a lake. The house is probably worth seven eight hundred thousand dollars. Pool. So, um, I go there. I meet her her husband and kids. A couple days later, I move all my stuff. I move, get, walk out of the halfway house. Move all my stuff out of the halfway house. And, um, yeah, so then I, I end up in the halfway house. I mean, I end up in the halfway house. I, I move into the, her, her, I'm going to say, I would say rooming house, you know, because I did, I rented a room. So I'm, you know, I end up moving into the rooming house to Stacy's spare room. And, you know, and so about, so at the, the same time period, I had been, I had called a guy named Danny. Jones. Um, Danny runs a, a YouTube channel called Concrete with a K. I think most people probably know this. Concrete with a K. So at the time, you know, it was doing pretty well. It had like three, I want to say it had 300,000 subscribers. He had about 300,000 subscribers. Might have been under 300 or maybe it was like a little, right at 300, let's say. So about, about 300,000 subscribers. And I had called him in the halfway house. I'd sent him an email, and then we spoke on the phone. I told him who I was, but I also told him that I'd written a bunch of of true crime stories, and I was wondering, thinking about starting a podcast. I was wondering if he could answer some questions. So he, of course, being Danny, takes that and turns it into – he says, look, I can answer your questions. I can. I don't mind helping you out, but he says, you really want to know if, if you're any good speaking in front of a camera or if anybody's going to be interested in you or your story. He said, you should come on my show. And tell your story. I was like, I don't know. I said, I know I have an amazing story. So my fear is I tell my story and people start focusing on me and not really focusing on these amazing true crime stories that I've written. And he's like, bro, I mean, honestly, man, you know, you really should come on. And you can always come back and talk about your stories, these other stories. I was like, all right, all right. So I put him off because I was in the halfway house. I'm like, yeah, bro, I can't, I can't, I can't. So finally what happens is I'd been in Stacy's a, probably a month or so, and Danny calls me up one day, and he's like, "Listen, you're not in the halfway house. You're living in someone's spare room. You have a vehicle. I've answered all your questions regarding YouTube and how to start a podcast and the whole thing. You said you'd come on the show. I haven't posted anything in almost two weeks. I need you to come and do a fucking interview with me." He said, "I mean, I was like." I mean, he, like, it's like, he's right. Like he did. I did say I'd do it. He has been really cool with me. Um, I was like, all right, bro. When he's like tonight, I was like, oh shit. So 
I throw on a shirt. I drive to St. Petersburg. Um, or he always says Seminole. No, it was whatever. Uh, which is really, I think Seminole is in St. Pete. But is it? Uh, what did you say? Next to St. Whatever. Doesn't matter. I drive there. Uh, go there. I remember I walked in. And it, he was there. And I think some other guy was there. Uh, it wasn't Hat Rack. No, no, Hat Rack was there. Hat Rack was there. Real name is Shane. Um, so Shane was there, but, um, so he was there and we sit down and he goes, how long does your story take? And I just said, shit, man, I can tell it in five minutes. I got a five minute version. I got a 15 minute version. I got an hour version. I got a two hour version. He goes, give me the two hour version. I said, all right. So I talked for like two hours and 15 minutes. And I think that video has like 1.8 million views right now within the first three months. I think it got like a million views and he was, you know, ecstatic. So. I did really well. That was doing really well. Well, at some point, after it had been up for like a month or so, Jess saw the story. She saw the podcast. So people in the halfway house are passing it around. And then people are still friends from being in the halfway house together. So she ends up getting it. She watches it. She texts me one day and says, hey, listen, I'm supposed to be coming into Tampa would you like to, um, she said, I've been thinking about you lately. Um, and I was wondering if you wanted to, um, you know, ha get lunch or dinner or something. And I went, um, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. So I texted her back. I said, yeah, of course I'd love to. Um, I said, she goes, okay, well, you know, and I said, yeah, when? And she told me, you know, oh, we came up with a time and I said, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, well it's a date. And she goes, no, it's not a date. I'm just saying it's friends. Because she actually was dating a chick that she had met in prison. That girl lived in Tennessee. And I, and she, I remember she used to always say, well, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to end up together. And I was like, you're not going to end up together. And I'm like, I can tell you right now you're not going to end up together because this girl's been on probation for over a year and a half. And she's, she, if you were going to end up together, she would have come down here. She can easily get her, her um, probation transferred. And she had nothing but excuses. I was like, look, that's over. You don't know it's over. You're still holding out hope. But I promise you, she's dating somebody else. Like, I'm doing everything I can to undermine that relationship. You know what I'm saying? And I'm saying it in such a way that I wasn't that bra brass about it. I was very, well, you know, this probably what happened. Well, you know, it's not a big deal. Like, a relationship in prison is probably different. And, you know, I'm trying to be understanding. But I also want to get into her pants. So, um, where I'm presuming to be understanding when my real goal is to get in her pants. So anyway, we're on. So she's like, okay, so let's go to dinner. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she goes, yeah, we'll do it as friends. And I was like, no, no, not as friends. It's a date. And she goes, no, no, I just, I have a girlfriend. I just want it to be friends. And I went, no, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to go on a, to dinner with you as friends. And she was like, well, I want it to be friends. I said, well, that's really irrelevant. I'm not going as friends. And she goes, well, then we're not going to go. I said, well, then we're not going to go. And she goes, why can't we go as friends? And I go, let me, let me, look, let, let's just, let me just be honest with you. I said, there is nothing more useless in the world than having a female friend that you're attracted to. Like that is the most useless friendship out there. Like the whole time she thinks she's building a friendship. All I'm doing is waiting for an opportunity to nail her. Like I'll, it's not that hard to maintain a relationship, right? Like with a, a chick, you can, you can text once or twice a day, say some flirty cutie stuff. And then at some point there's a weakening, there's a chink in the armor of the relationship that she's currently in and boom, you're in there. So, you know, you're just hell, you know, so, and that's not because I'm living in a half, I'm living in somebody's spare room. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know if it's not like I got women falling out of this guy and every woman that I dated, that I tried to date, like I got on some of these apps, catastrophes. I mean, every time they would look me up, it was over. It was done. So, so yeah. So, she, Jess says, yeah, she doesn't want to go on a date with me. She says, well, then forget it then. We're not going to then forget it. I said, okay, fine. And she's like, you're serious? I go, yeah, I'm serious. So, maybe a week later, we were supposed to go again. She schedules and we schedule. And she calls back. She's like, you were serious? I go, yeah, I'm serious. She goes, I said, look, well, we can go, we'll go. I said, you can call it what you want. I'll call it a date. So, we schedule another time. She was supposed to call me and she stood me up. Then a couple days later, you know, she, like she was like, I'll text you when I get off work. Well, she worked late. She didn't text me, you know. 
which was bullshit. But a couple days later, she texted me, I'm sorry, I was working late. I know that was a shitty thing. But I still want to see you Can, next week. Next week, same type of thing happens. Next week, or maybe two weeks go by, enough. Uh, she texts me, look, I, I'm coming. I'm going to be off work at this time. I can meet you. Can we go out? And I went, yes, as a date. She goes, not as a date. And I said, let me explain to you something. I said, this is a date in my mind. If you don't want to call it a date, that's fine. But it's, it's, it's a date in my mind. She says, okay, whatever. So then I head to the restaurant. And I remember my ex-wife called me. And she's like, why are you going to dinner with this girl that has a girlfriend that says she does not like you? She's not interested in you. And she's telling you it's not a date. And why are you going? I said, let me explain something. I said, I'm going to go on the date. I'm going to be charming. I'm going to be funny. I'm going to buy her dinner. It's, we're going to laugh. We're going to go to the movies. We're going to hang out. I'm going to be just amazing. And I said, at the end of the date, I'm going to try and kiss her. Now, if she doesn't kiss me, we're good. I know. This was your chance. I know. I get it. It's, it didn't work. You're not interested. But if she does kiss me, then I know the whole fucking time it was bullshit. And I, my intuition was right, and she was interested. What happens is I go to the, I end up going to um, meet her. And she, when she shows up, she's wearing a long sleeve. I remember too, it was burgundy. It was a burgundy long sleeve shirt. She had makeup on, hair's done, blue jeans. She looked amazing. Cowboy boots. She always wears cowboy boots. And I just was like, and I, when I, I was like, hey, what's up? She walks up and she gives me this huge hug. And like, I let go. Like I hugged her for a second and then let go. And she just kept holding me. And so I kind of hugged her back, rubbed her back a little bit. And then she kind of let go and she smiled at me. And listen, I knew right then, you didn't dress up like this for your friend. So we go, we eat. She laughs at every single joke I tell, every single grins, smiles, and I'm not that funny. Like it was overboard. The flirtation was outrageous. Then we end up going, we get in my car, we leave, we get in my car, my little Jeep, get in my Jeep, go to the movies. When we go to the movies, it's packed. Like we can't, you know, you can't even get into the movies because it was opening night of Star Wars, the new Star Wars. And so we couldn't get in. So we get back in. We get in my truck and my little Jeep. And I get in. And she gets in. And she goes, well, we're not going to the movie. She says, well, what do you, what do you want to do now? And I go, well, I want to make out in the car. What do you want to do? And she goes, and she looks at me and she kind of kind of rocks her head and kind of shrugs. And I thought, oh, hell no. Boom. I mean, listen, I, I, there was like a gap like this. Like I'm in my seat. Like, like, and I mean, I went, I went, whoo, I was right there in her fucking seat right next to her. I mean, she'll, to this day, she'll say, I was so nervous. Like she's like, you jumped forward and nose to nose looking at her. Like I'm, I'm waiting for her to be like, okay, good enough, forget it. Like I'm, I'm assuming it's not going anywhere. Like I, I, even though I knew, I felt it. I thought this is her chance. Like, like I, I'm no, I have very little, the, I have very little embarrassment in me, right? Like, like it's hard to shame me or make me feel embarrassed at this point in my life. So if I got right up to her, she's like, "No, what are you doing? Forget it. It's not gonna happen. I told you." I would, I'd be like, "Yeah, all right. Now I know." And I'd have dropped her off, but that's not what happened. We start making out. We made out so much for like probably for hours. So much my lips were were um uh what is it? We chapped. My lips, were, her lips were chapped. We had to stop multiple times. We were like, look, we gotta stop kissing. We have to stop kissing. Like it, my lips are killing me. They're chapped. They're this, and then boom, we'd start making out again. So anyway, a couple days later, so we nothing. We we end up. I end up taking her back. We end up making out in the back of the. AMC theaters. We drove around back in the back of the, like all class, right? All class. In the back of the AMC theaters, we end up making out, by the way. And by this time, I'm not 49. I am 50. So I'm 18 years older than her. Like, not a bad comeback, right? So fresh out of prison, making out with some chick. Um, 
it wasn't like right. I don't think it was right next to the dumpsters, but we could have should have added right next to the should throw in next time. I'll say right next to the dumpsters. No, but anyway, we made out for hours and hours, and then I end up having to, I end up dropping her off, and she leaves, and then you know we went to we got back together a couple days later, and um, you know I think we rented a hotel. It's nice, right? Mm-hmm. And we're not messing around. Like I'm straight for the same thing. We went to the movies that time. Mm-hmm. Got out. She's well, what do you want to do? I said I want to go rent a motel room. What do you want to do? And she was like. Oh my god, I can't believe this. I was like, yeah, let, yeah, yeah. Like I'm not I'm not pussyfooting around here. I I'm down to I, we need to handle business here. Okay? I got a lot of pent up sexual tension here. So anyway, yeah. So uh we've been dating since then. We did break up a couple times, crushing to me. And uh yeah, that's a whole video. She should be here for that. We could drag I could drag that fucker out for two hours right then. And we'd argue too, because it's one of the few things we argue about. One, how many times she broke up with me, why we broke up, getting back together. So, you know, but that could be a whole thing. That could be a whole thing. Yeah. Um all right. I think that's the end of my story because at this point, you know, it was, I, I mean, there are some other things like I, I, I had a deal with a Blumhouse Productions on a thing. Oh, I didn't even talk about, I was uh, interviewed by a couple magazines. I was interviewed by Forbes magazine. I was interviewed by, what else was I interviewed by? Uh, the Atlantic did an uh, interview about me getting out of prison. They were basically like, he's a true crime writer. Um, and I've optioned several, since I've been out of prison, I've optioned several books, several of my true crime books. Should I have focused on that? Ah, I don't know, whatever. whatever. I've optioned several of my stories. Um, you know, it, it just takes a lot. Like I could get do a whole hour on how many things have gone wrong. But the problem is, is that, and this is the, the thing that I know about this, just having talked to guys that are in the industry and other reporters, is that, you know, there are guys that do nothing but write articles in magazines and option those articles, and those articles and those options never end up getting made into movies. And they'll, they'll, my, I remember my literary agent, um, he told me, this is the guy who got me the, the deal on, uh, Generation Oxy. He told me that he said he has, Authors that do nothing but write books that get optioned three or four times. He was, and they've sold 30, 40 options. And they're constantly being re-optioned because you option in something for like 18 months and then it gets re-optioned. So you said they'll have, they'll have like 30 of them. He is, they've never been made into a movie or, or, or a series. Nothing's ever happened. They just re-option them and re-option them and re-option them. And they make good livings writing books that are optioned. And he's like, they make a decent living. You know, and so I, I was always, you know, he told me this when I was in prison. And so I always remember thinking, so if I could get it to the point where this is before I started doing, you know, the podcasting or painting, and I'm still in prison kind of thinking about what I was going to do. And I remember thinking like, I could just, I could just option shit for the rest of my life. Like I, how hard is it to just write stories? And uh, I don't even try and get the stories into, into, I don't even try and get them into magazines, which is really something I should be doing. Um, but if I just optioned these art or these stories that I'm writing on these guys and option them, like you could live your whole life just on those options. So, so even though I've optioned a bunch of stuff, bunch of stories that I have, like I've my buddy Rossini's story, I optioned, um, uh, Boziak's I've optioned, uh, generation oxy, that one, um, God, I mean, there's a, uh, anyway, the point is, is that. You know, I would love for those stories to be made into movies or f- some kind of like a, a series or something. Uh, and and actually, I'm getting a couple of them right now are being turned into documentaries. And that gives you the ability to to ha- say, hey, to be able to point it at a, a, a longer version of the story that you can then option into or parlay into a series of some kind or maybe a, a full length you know feature film or something. But the point is, is that. You know, if that never happens, it never happens. I mean, obviously, it's what I want to happen, but we'll see. So, um, 
I don't know where else to go with this. I appreciate you guys checking out the uh, or listening or watching or whatever. And um, if you like the story, you know, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell. Also, there's a thank you button now uh, YouTube has where you go. It's it's on the the same same bar that you ha where the likes are where it's like like and share and all those, you can swivel it over and there's a little dollar sign and you hit that and it's a thank you button. You can leave me like five bucks, three, two bucks, five bucks, 10 or, or 50 bucks, something like that. I don't know. You can leave different amounts. So that would be great if you're interested. If you're interested in, in kind of su helping support the channel and letting me, you know, make, you know, different content and do these interviews and continue to do them. Obviously, I have a Patreon. You can join for like $10 a month. You can join for 50 bucks a month. You can join for $125 a month. Um, also, all my books are available on Amazon. Between Amazon and Borders Books, uh, I think all my books are available. So, yeah, and I'm going to try and continue this series. I'm probably going to talk about some of the other books. I might take the Frank Amadeo story and kind of tell the whole story of uh, Frank Amadeo, which is basically my, my book, maybe do a multi-part series on that possibly let me know in the comment section if that's something you guys are interested in um also i could probably do a bailout which is another one i have oh, there's a bunch of books that i have uh and they're all almost all of them are available on audible so i appreciate you guys watching thank you very much and i really do appreciate it so see ya